Well, thank you so much for organizing and for um, inviting me to speak. This has just been great. So the talk I'm giving today is actually at the intersection of two research projects I've been doing. One is looking at the emergence or cultural evolution of inequitable norms and conventions, especially between genders and races. And then the other involves modeling scientists or communities of scientists and researchers. And then this is sort of both of those things, looking at social identity and science, and especially how it influences credit allocation and then decisions about who people collaborate with. This is joint research with Hannah Rubin, another philosopher of science who's now starting a faculty position at Notre Dame. So, okay. The big picture is that in this work, we're looking at the dynamics of discrimination as far as credit allocation and then collaborative choices in epistemic communities. And there were some empirical motivations for this modeling project. In particular, there are two, result, sorry, two sets of results. One finding that in some fields, women are less likely to hold prestigious authorship positions. And then another set of results finding that in some fields, often the same ones, women and people of color are less likely to engage in collaborative research, and then when they do, are more likely to collaborate with in-group members. So part of our question was, is there some kind of connection here between these two results? Um, in previous work, Justin Bruner, another philosopher of science and I, looked at models where we showed that if there's uh, discrimination in credit sharing, that might disincentivize collaboration by the folks being discriminated against. So that was kind of a teaser result, and then Hannah and I worked out an analysis of this in much more detail, which is what I'm presenting today. All right, so here's a little roadmap. So first I'll give kind of a methodological overview. Then I'll present three sets of results. So our network, or sorry, our model has two parts a network and then a bargaining interaction. So first we hold the network fixed and let the bargaining behavior evolve. Then we hold the bargaining behavior fixed and let the network evolve. And then we let them co-evolve to see what happens in each case. All right, so the methodology. So what we're looking at are agent-based models of actors who play the Nash demand game on a network. So I'm gonna start by describing the Nash demand game for people who aren't familiar with it. It's sometimes called divide the pie. So this is a model of a strategic interaction where you have two individuals who are dividing some sort of resource. So it's resource division. And the rules are that they can make a demand for some portion of the resource. So maybe they ask for half of it or 90% of it or 12% of it. And then if their demands are compatible, they each get what they asked for. If their demands are incompatible and that they push too hard, the assumption is that they can't successfully divide the resource. They're both too aggressive in their demands, and so they get some poor payoff instead. So because we're doing evolutionary style, mo style modeling, we look at a finite, limited, few strategy version of this game. So in particular, we assume that the resource has a value of 10, and then the actors can make either a low, medium, or high demand. And we constrain the demand so that medium is always for half of it, for five, and then high and low are compatible. So it could be like two, five, and eight, or four, five, and six. So this is a payoff table of this simplified Nash demand game. So we have player one and player two. They each can make low, medium, or high demands. And then the entries show the payoffs with player one first. So if they both demand low, well, 4 plus 4 is less than 10, so they each get what they demanded. Same thing if they mo both demand medium. But say one demands high and the other medium, well, 6 plus 5 is more than 10. So it's assumed they haven't successfully bargained and they get a poor payoff, which we just picked to be zero. It doesn't actually matter very much. So this model has three pure strategy Nash equilibria, um, which are pairs of strategies where no one wants to change what they're doing because they can't get better payoffs by changing. In particular, these are important in evolutionary models because if you're at a Nash equilibria, they're, they're stable. There isn't this incentive to change. So they tend to be the endpoints of evolutionary processes. We can see here the three equilibria are uh, patterns of behavior where they're perfectly dividing the resource. So player one demands high and player two low. 
they both demand medium, or player one demands low and player two high. And at these situations, you can imagine if you are one of the players, if you demand more, now you over demand the resource and you don't get anything. Or if you demand less, you just get less. So that's why these are stable. So we have these three equilibria. Notice that they have slightly different character. In particular, we might want to say something like, this equilibria is fair in the sense that the actors get the same amount. It's symmetric. And we might call these two unfair because one player gets more than the other. So in particular, we're going to look at models where you have two types of cultural actors, two different identity groups or social categories, where these could correspond to gender or to race, or even something like professors and graduate students. So it has to be divisions that everybody in the group recognizes as salient divisions for interaction. And then when we are observing in our model patterns of behavior where one group consistently makes high demands and then the other consistently makes low demands, we're going to use that as a kind of minimal representation of discrimination between groups. So this is how we capture this kind of very minimal, thin notion of discrimination. You have a situation where you could have kind of fair dealing or either side could get more. So when one side gets more, we treat that as discrimination. So to be clear, here's kind of an image of how this is supposed to work. We have, yeah, <laughs> we have two groups. So you know, we have the star belly sneeches whose bellies have stars, and then the um, plain belly sneeches with none upon thars. So <laughs> I have young children. <laughs> <laughs> a social pattern where you see like medium demands within the in-groups, but then a high and a low demand with the out-group. That's going to be discrimination. OK. All right, so that's our bear catch of discrimination. How do we apply this to epistemic or scientific communities? So this is a game of resource division. You can also use it as a representation of both joint action and resource division. And it's been used that way in philosophy of science a few times. So you sort of assume the resource is formed by the two individuals, and then they divide it. And in particular, we're going to focus on an interpretation of this game where the uh, two actors are engaging in collaboration together. They have to divide credit. Um, and so that's what this is going to capture. But I want to flag for everyone that this is actually a model that's much more general than that. It can really apply to any situation where you have a resource division and then you have relevant social categories. Uh, yeah? I just wanted to make sure I understand. So the, the groups are ranked in some way? There's no, ranking. There's no ranking. It's just that everybody recognizes that you're in that group and okay. you're in that so group. So like a more powerful group would make always specific mm -hmm. like no, we, we don't make any assumptions about which groups make what demands. We let that emerge endogenously in the model. Mm -hmm. OK. So under this academic interpretation, we're going to have collaborators who produce a resource, publishable research. And this exceeds what they could produce independently, which fits empirical observations of collaboration. But in order to do this, they're going to have to bargain, at least implicitly, but sometimes explicitly, to determine who's going to do what research and how much. So who's going to put in how much work. And then who is going to get credit in the form of things like author order. All right. So that's the bargaining model and interpretation of it. So to fill in the rest of the picture, we're going to have agents playing these bargaining games on networks where the nodes are going to represent academics, and then links represent their collaborative endeavors. All right, so on to the first set of results, where we have a fixed network but evolving bargaining. So um, there have been previous results looking at the nash Man game on networks, where you have two identity groups like this. And they found that you can pretty commonly get discriminatory norms in the sense that I had outlined emerging on these kinds of networks. So we knew that was possible and that happened pretty commonly in a basic model. One thing we wanted to ask was, if we took one of the groups and made it smaller, would we observe a minority disadvantage or some kind of difference happening because one group was small? And we had some theoretical reasons for thinking this. Um, so in work, 
starting with Justin Bruner and then that he and I have extended together, um, we've shown that in general cultural interactive situations, when you have a minority and a majority group interacting to bargain, the minority group can be disadvantaged by dint of their size and their size alone for the following reason. So if you think about a small and a large group interaction, the minority types are gonna meet their outgroup with very high probability because they're in the minority. They're always meeting their outgroup. Whereas the majority type is gonna meet their outgroup much less often. So this is just a fact of numbers. What this can mean is that minority types learn more quickly how to interact with their outgroup. So there's some speed difference in learning, we expect. In the bargaining game, that often means learning accommodating behavior. So it often makes sense in a bargaining game if you're like matching with people who could do anything to make a low demand that's safe. And so we see a disadvantage arising when minority groups quickly learn to make a low demand and then the majority group takes advantage of that. Do we have to assume that there's some like, small difference in their strategy? No, you just totally randomly initialize their strategies. And then we've looked at a lot of different modeling assumptions, population structures, different things, and can repeat this effect. Yeah. So learning is happening at the level of the individual agent. That's so right. Additional communication with other current members of the agreement. Yeah, there's no strategizing at the group level. We always make assumptions like you're learning based on success, imitating success, or you're learning a best response to the other population. Based on your own history. Of based on your history or history of others in the sense that you might imitate them but not that you would talk to them and say, like, let's get together and screw this out group. Okay, That's so probably not appropriate. <laughs> so yeah. in this simulation, you're seeing other people's success or failure, too, in some, some way. You might, but um, we look at mostly low rationality models because I'm more in the evolutionary game theory side. Lower bounded rationality. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we knew that this could happen in more randomly mixing populations. We wanted to see, will this happen on the network? So what we did is looked at randomly formed networks, uh, and then we gave initially completely random in and out group strategies, so no difference between the two groups. And then what we did was, with each round, we'd have with some small probability an agent updating their strategy with a myopic best response. So they look around and see, I'm interacting with these different people, What's the best thing I can do given how they're treating me? And then they update to do that new best thing. So that looks like this. We randomly form a network. We have the two groups here, star bellies and plain bellies. Um, they each get a random strategy for what they do with their in-group and with their out-group. Then suppose this individual is selected. Right now they're doing high against both. They look at what their in-group is doing to them, medium what their outgroup is doing, uh, medium and high, and then they best respond, so they update to a new set of strategies. So here was what we found. In general, agents learn the equitable demand with in-group members, and I'm happy to talk about why that tends to happen during Q&A. We found that this was also the most common situation with outgroup members, but a significant portion of simulations would go to inequitable norms, and then minority status would also lead to disadvantage. So here's a little slide showing that. So on the x-axis here, we have the minority percentage. So here the two groups are equally sized, and then it goes down. And then we look at when fair bargaining emerges or the two possible discriminatory norms. So this side demands more or this side demands more. So when they're 50-50, fair bargaining is by far more common and then it's equally likely that either discriminates against the other. As the minority group gets smaller, fair bargaining becomes less likely, the majority becomes more likely to discriminate, and the minority quite unlikely to discriminate because of that size difference alone. Why on earth would we see this? So given some number of between group links, so every network has a fixed number n of links between the two groups, the majority members are gonna have fewer each, and the minority members are gonna have more each. So just to demonstrate this, here's the network before, remove the in-group links. It just, there's six between group links, and as it happens, each uh, minority member has two of those, and each majority member has one, because there's more majority members. 
So that's going to shift the best responses. And in general, in Nash demand games, it's going to make lower responses better, more common as a best response, and higher ones less common for the minority because they're interacting with more outgroup. So a takeaway from this first result is that on networks, as in mixing populations, which we showed before, minority status can potentially lead to disadvantage in the emergence of bargaining norms. Now, there are ways to break this result, and I'm happy to talk about that too, but there's some robustness there. OK, so that was we fixed the network and evolved the bargaining. Now let's talk about when we fix the bargaining and evolve the network. So we started on the assumption that discrimination was happening. So that was the situation we were interested in. In particular, we said, suppose group A always demands high against group B. Uh, in particular, assume that the agents are fair with their in-group, which does tend to emerge. And then between group, the majority will always get six when they collaborate with the out-group. And the minority group will always get four when they collaborate with their out-group. So there's some low level of discrimination happening. And these numbers don't matter as long as the low is lower than five and the high is higher than five. So we used a network forming procedure from Watts. Again, it's, a, a, well, I'll describe it. OK, so what happens is that you start with a totally empty network. Then in each time step, you pick two agents randomly. One is going to be an updater, and then one is their potential collaborator. And then based on a preference algorithm, which has more steps than I want to describe right now, they decide to form a new link and or break an old one. But the basic rules are that if you're an updater and you have an opportunity to make a new link, you do it if it's going to improve your payoff. And then you have some maximum number of links. So if I'm interacting with someone who's discriminating against me, and then I get an opportunity to interact with someone who doesn't, I'll be willing to break the old link and pick the new uh, collaborator. So that looks kind of like this. Two agents are randomly chosen. They don't have any links. So forming one will improve their payoff. Again, as long as they haven't reached their maximum links, they're always going to form links. But then say this updater is chosen and this potential collaborator this person might be willing to drop that old link to get a new one with someone who will give them a higher payoff. So this isn't a shocking result, but what you see in this kind of update procedure is that eventually all the between group links will be broken because the minority members, assuming this very homogenous discrimination, are going to prefer to form within group links because it gets them a higher payoff. I mean, you probably could have guessed that. Here's an example of how a single run of the simulation would go, but they all end up at the same thing. So here's time changing on the x-axis. And then these uh, lines are tracking the number of links. So between group links, within minority links, and within majority links. So in the beginning of the simulation, everyone's linking with everyone because any collaboration is good for them when they don't have their maximum number. But then at some point, the minority starts to break the between group collaborations. So those plummet. And then after that happens, minority members only want to collaborate with their in-group. And majority members would like to collaborate with the out-group, but are left only collaborating with majority members as well. So you get complete homophily in the network. So what we'll takeaway here is something like, well, discrimination can potentially lead to segregation in networks of joint action and collaboration. All right, so with that, the third set of results, the coevolution of bargaining and collaboration. So in this part of the paper, what we did was allowed both the bargaining and the network structure to be updating simultaneously. And what we did was we started with an empty network and random strategies. And then in every round, each agent would take an action with a small probability. So maybe 10% chance that each agent takes an action. And when they do, there's some chance that they update their strategy and then some chance that they update their links. And then they do these updates in the same way that we described in the last two section. So if I'm going to take an action, I either update my strategy by looking at my collaborators and saying, well, what strategy would be better for me to take given how everyone else is treating me and then changing what I'm doing, or by looking at my 
a, some collaborator and then some other potential collaborator and saying, I'm gonna get rid of this person and hook up with this other person who is going to give me a better deal as far as credit goes. So our results were that within groups, we again saw fair norms emerging. I think I have time to sort of explain this actually. So this is a very um, robust finding across models of the evolution of bargaining that you see fairness emerging in in groups, basically because the um, the fair demand is the only symmetric strategy. So it's the only one that everybody can take and then always reach a Nash equilibrium. So if everyone demands five, then you always perfectly divide the resource. If some people do high and some people do low, then you're going to have inefficiency in that when highs meet each other or lows meet each other, you're not going to get a Nash equilibrium. So you see this real heading towards fairness within groups. Here we show, and in this whole project, that when you have, as soon as you have categories or outgroups, that's broken and you get an asymmetry that lets you get discrimination. So then what we see in these models is that between groups, you get these sub pockets of fair and discriminatory behavior. And then the fair links end up being maintained between the groups and the discriminatory ones are broken. And then you end up with this partially segregated network where throughout the network, everyone's treating each other fairly. You're only getting fair divisions of credit, but there are individuals with these unused discriminatory strategies towards their out group. And it could be going both ways, these discriminatory strategies, but no one will interact with them in the out group if they can get fair in their in group. So this led us to sort of another question. Um, if we vary the minority size in these co-evolving networks, uh, does that change the outcome? Um, and we found that it did. So even with the co-evolution, the smaller the minority, the greater the chance that the majority individuals are discriminating against them or holding discriminatory, discriminatory strategies towards them. And then that also led us to ask, okay, does an increase in discrimination like this or minority status increase homophily? So homophily here meaning a preference to interact only with your in-group and not with the out-group. And again, indeed it did. So this showed across all the simulations we did, um, what percentage of the minority group was discriminating in that simulation, so maybe 80% of them were, or 20%, and then how much homophily was there in the network? And we used a standard measure of homophily to see, like, given that you're in X group, what percentage of your links are with your own group versus the other group? And you can see this clear trend line that as majority discrimination goes up, homophily or segregation into your own groups goes up as well. So here's what these outcomes tend to look like. Um, so here's an example of, oh yeah. So homophily, are you, do you mean homophily is used in different senses? One is that it's a preference for interacting with other and one is that it's an outcome uh, in which you are sorting. Yeah, this is the sorted outcome. So there's no innate preference to interact with your in-group. It's entirely based on the linking procedure. And then we measure, given the size of a minority group and the size of a majority group, what percentage of the network would you expect to be between groups randomly? So if you generated a random network, what would the expectation be for how many of those would be between groups? And then we compare how many were between groups in fact in our network, and then that gives us a measure of homophily. So how far did you deviate from random interaction? And then you're looking at the, uh, the discrimination in the, for those. Um, so we say, given some probability of network linking, what would be the expected average number of between group links yeah. in the network? And then we say, what's the actual number of between group links in the network? And then basically divide and yeah, gives you a measure. OK. So yeah, this is what these networks will tend to look like. Um, you see homophily with the two groups, so the minority groups are in pink here. And then in a case where you have less discrimination, the two groups have more between group collaborations. In a case with more discrimination, you see more homophily, a greater separation between the two groups. 
Yeah. It looks like in the more discrimination, you've got little indi individuals uh -huh. embedded in, in the red individuals in the blue mm -hmm. network. Is, so is there, yeah. is there some difficulty in forming ties, those individuals, with uh, their uh, with their minority compatriots? So what's happening here is that, by chance, this individual um, was randomly hooked up with mostly outgroup members at the beginning, and then none of those outgroup members or a small percentage of them were discriminatory. So then they never broke those links and didn't happen to make links to their in-group. So this is a minority group who, or a minority member who has fair collaborations with their outgroup only. Yeah. So yeah, you have, you have this mixing and complexity in the network, but then just the general tendency towards homophily. All right, so I think the takeaway for this last bit is that this evolving network allows for this variety of bargaining behaviors to coexist in the population. So that actually is kind of its own finding because in this type of model, you tend to see homogeneity of behavior arising, but because we have the network, you get this heterogeneity of bargaining and discriminatory behavior. And then we expect in this co-evolving population, majority discrimination and homophily to a lesser degree than in the fixed network or in the bargaining condition, but still emerging. So to sum up here, on networks, we find that minority status can confer a bargaining disadvantage, as we had found in other types of models. Our results predict homophily based on social group membership in collaboration networks. And as I didn't actually discuss this. Uh, if you were a philosophy of science crowd, I would have said more about how this could impact or change academic pro pro sorry, progress and theory change. And with that, I will thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
and you're, they're, they're, they're choosing their best responses based on sampling from a bounded history of play from the other population. Mm -hmm. The group with the largest sample size mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is the one that gets the better deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because they have a larger uh, sample size, any uh, mutations by the other group or errors by the other group are unlikely to move them. You need far more errors mm -hmm. to be able to get them to shift best responses. Mm -hmm. And where they're going to shift, they're more likely to shift down than up, which is what yeah. you're talking about there. There's definitely a connection between that and this, but it's not so in the, the same. the minority situation, mm -hmm. the minorities have more, each minority member has more links to a majority member mm -hmm. than, a, than a given majority member has to a minority member. Mm -hmm. And so that plays the role of the sample sizes. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's just harder to, to shift a majority member because they have, they're linked to fewer minority members than mm -hmm. it is for, to shift a minority member. And the shifts tend to be downward. And so therefore, that, I think that is the source of the minority. I, I'm not sure okay. because, in fact, as I was thinking about it, I was like, oh, yeah, this is analogous. But in fact, in this model, the minority is the one with the small memory because they just have one. And the, ma sorry, the majority has the small memory. The minority has the large memory. So um, in the Peyton Young models, the long memory is better for you. Yeah. because it makes you more intransigent and more stubborn. And that actually, we connected that to the previous results because it was like, if you have this long memory and you won't change behavior, yeah. you're just like the majority group who almost never meets your minority outgroup. So this is weirder. And I'll, I'll just flag for everyone. I think this minority disadvantage result is pretty um, robust in general, but this network result I think of as a little more iffy because it kind of depends on these like numerical combinatorics a bit more rather than some intuitive thing that drives it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so have you thought about what would happen or how you would approach a simulation where there's heterogeneity in the value of different pairings? So yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one, of the, one of the problems here, sort of conceptual, is that the whole reason sort of collaboration makes sense is not just economies of scale, but, but uh, because of particular pairings. Yeah, perfect. So in fact, we have a follow-up paper with one of the grad students in our department, Mike Schneider, looking at just this question. So suppose the pie gets bigger or smaller for different pairings. And in that paper, we focus on the idea that the pie could get larger because one group is empowered, so our group in general just gets more academic credit, and so we, get, we make bigger pies together, and we make bigger pies between groups than one. So that's a possibility. We also explore the possibility that there's some kind of synergy, like say the groups are coming from two different nations, and then they get some benefit from bringing their two perspectives, and so the between group pie is better. We haven't looked at just the, I, the effect of like, you know, different abilities or different specialties on pi size, where we just create homogeneity that these two people happen to make a great collaboration. But that, it would be really interesting to look at, and it should have some effect. So yeah, say. The problem with, I'm sorry to interrupt. But no, go ahead. In, in a sense, the problem here is that although you might end up with a tremendous amount of segregation, mm -hmm. there's nothing really lost, you know? Uh, you know and yeah. Presumably there is, the whole argument for diversity, at least, that goes on in campus. Is that it's supposed to be good for you somehow. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So the, the model where we say like, oh, the between group pies are bigger, there is something lost when you have discrimination and unlinking. Here it's just like, oh, is segregation supposed to be bad? Everyone gets a fair outcome and still is like working and everything. Um, but I agree, that would be interesting to assume that like some properties of the agents make their collaborations better and then does discrimination lead to overall less efficiency in the group or something like that? That would be really neat to look at. Yeah, um, Christina. Just to follow up on that. So in the one way you let them, I guess in two of them, you let the network evolve, but you mm -hmm. still constrain how many links they have, right? Mm -hmm. Each decision requires a link. So one possible, one possible inequality would be where links, where you allow a different number of links. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Evolve. Yeah, that might be interesting, too. And fits with intuitions mm -hmm. as well. And also your, the data that you suggested that there's less collaboration going on. Mm -hmm. In general. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting. The only thing we've looked at with respect to that was we thought about, oh, how could you incentivize between group linking? Maybe you give grants where you can get a grad student to do some of the work for you, and then you can afford another link or something like that. And could that improve the situation? Um, and 
that it was an interesting result because it, we were like, okay, suppose there are these special grants for between group links. You do get more between group links, but if the discriminatory norms are there already or have emerged, then that's, it's like it creates diversity in your collaborations, but then someone is being discriminated against. So it's sort of this like devil's bargain outcome. Uh, yeah, sorry, Travis, you had your hand up. Uh, um, so just in this sort of same line about looking at uh, how one might extend this model and add little gadgets to it to get something more like what we see in real world collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, uh, and I don't know, maybe you've thought about this, but um, right in the real world when we have these network links, we don't necessarily just get to break them cost free, right? mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and especially mm -hmm. in academic collaboration, right? It might be the case that if we link up and for right off the bat you're discriminating against me, I might just go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But if we've linked up and, and we've been working together a lot mm -hmm. time, right, several rounds, you start to discriminate against me, there might become a social cost for me to actually. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, that it's hard to establish new collaborations and you might get angry at me for breaking our long term collaboration. Yeah, that seems right. Yeah, Peter. So another, have you looked at uh, the situation in which the uh, collaborators uh, selectively uh, build a link. So suppose you had perfect information about all the people out there mm -hmm. that you might mm -hmm. link with, and they have perfect information about you. Mm -hmm. And there's probably some collaborator out there uh, who would we'd select each other because our joint product mm -hmm. would be uh, larger mm -hmm. know, than with any other link. Yeah, so we haven't looked at that. That seems to relate to Larry's idea where there might be um, synergy. Yeah. But this would be some variant in, you know, maybe even like quality or productiveness or something like that. And then you could have, a, you'd expect dynamics to arise where the most productive are choosing each other for reasons that don't have to do with social identity. Um, we haven't looked at anything like that, but that, that could be interesting. And, like how, you know, I think of course in the real world these situations are interacting with things like what do I expect to get credit wise with this person or do I expect them to somehow treat me differently um, because of my identity. Yeah. My rule of thumb for collaborating is always collaborate with somebody that's smarter than you are. Yeah. <laughs> if right. They're, if they have the same rule, then, then uh, each of the collaborators got to be smarter in a different way. And so yeah, so you expect the synergy, synergy choices. Uh, collaboration. Yeah, and I ex certainly that's realistic, and it would be something that would add some realism to the model. Yeah. Um, I mean, all of these are showing only two groups. Mm -hmm, if you mm -hmm. Tried it with more groups. Do they get like a hierarchy of discrimination where middle groups discriminate against bottom? <laughs> like so we have looked at intersectional groups in these models, not in the network model, but in the randomly mixing model. It's, it turns out to be so much more complicated than we thought to model that. So we've looked at a bunch of different, the details are complicated, but you can either have like four different groups where everyone recognizes that they're completely different social identity groups. It's like, everyone's like, okay, we're gonna treat black women as their own group, black men as their own group, white women as their own group, white men as their own group. In that sort of situation, if you do like minority sizes, it's like the smallest one is the most disadvantaged, and then intermediate up to large, you see the disadvantage shaped by size, or if we add power to the model, we see a similar effect. You can also do it as something like where, you know, there's some discriminatory norm emerging on racial lines and some on gender lines or on any two cross-cutting lines, and then you can add interactions. Um, so yeah, we've done that, and then we get these sort of times very genuinely intersectional effects, like very non-additive effects for the smallest or the most disadvantaged groups but we haven't looked at how that might interact with network choices. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, if we're done, I don't want to. <laughs> um, so this is it's pretty speculative, but I think mm -hmm. there's kind of obvious implications for kind of scaling it up to societies, right? Not moving beyond academic collaboration, right? And talking about, let's say, social democracy. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the implications, if I understand it, from your, your work is that the more um, ethnically, let's say if you have two groups, the more, let's say there's a 70-30, or the majority group is 70, the minority group is 30, you're less likely to have fair distribution mm -hmm. in that place, in that kind of society where you, let's say, had mm -hmm. either 
50 50 mm -hmm. or 91 is there a kind of a curvilinear i mean a curvilinear relationship at the end i realize there are two different kinds of games and then you have yeah. this, the the interaction between the bargaining and the network. yeah uh, but i mean all things being equal yeah um can can one scale this model up from e equity in academic collaboration yeah. to, to a more general well, so first of all, the minority effects we've found always get worse the smaller the minority is. So there isn't a curvilineal. Which is, which is weird in itself. I, I noticed because it is linear. You'd expect that 1% who would care. Yeah, right. Like, why are you even treating them differently? They're not their I mean, own group. No, nobody's a threat. There's no threat yeah. to the higher. I mean, I'm going back to my own work. Obviously. Yeah. It, you know, it doesn't seem to be that yeah. big of a deal. I think that's right, because we assume in the model that everyone's acting like there are genuine categories that matter. And when you have like a really small minority, people don't probably act that way. Um, I, so I do think that these can apply more broadly, and in fact, so I have a whole book on the emergence of inequitable norms in this general class of model, and I take this work and then extend it to talk more just about segregation, everything, yeah, <laughs> everything. <laughs> All the disadvantages, so yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. Let's thank Caelan. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.